Greetings to you all and welcome. My name is Michael Spath, and on behalf of the Good Shepherd Collective, the United Church of Christ Palestine Israel Network, the Palestinian Christian Alliance for Peace, and Indiana Center for Middle East Peace, welcome to this very important webinar on the Defund Racism Campaign. It's being co-sponsored by Friends of Sabeel North America, the Israel-Palestine Mission Network of the Presbyterian Church USA, the U.S. Campaign for Palestinian Rights, and ICAD USA. We activists who stand with our Palestinian friends are very good at educating our constituents on the issues, but we then cast about looking for things we can do to make a difference. The hosts of today's webinar believe that this is one of the most critically important efforts in which we can be involved as Americans. The Campaign to Defund Racism is a Palestinian-led movement to end the use of charitable funds raised in the U.S. for Israeli settler organizations. Monies are raised tax-free to fund Israeli settler extremism and violence, and it must end. Just for an example, uh, uh, in today's uh, Haaretz report, uh, today's Haaretz reports that the illegal Nahala settlement movement this week announced plans to establish three unauthorized outposts in the West Bank. Last week, it revealed that it had raised $1.4 million in just three days. But because it's uh, not a registered not for profit, to raise money, its U.S. crowdfunding page states American donors can make, tech, can make tax deductible donations to the campaign through charity and the Neiman Foundation USA. So this is a timely, timely issue. We will learn today in specific terms how the Nakba continues to today, how pro-Israeli U.S. organizations disguised as 501c3 charities fund Israeli settlements, their impact on Palestinians on the ground in places like Silwan, Sheikh Jarrah, the South Hebron Hills, Bedouin communities, and others, as well as activist groups already active here in the U.S., in New York, Florida, Pennsylvania, California, and others, who are exposing this racist funding of Israeli settlements. To prevent Zoom bombing, we're keeping your screens muted. Although we do have a full slate of questions, if you'd like to submit a question for our guests, please do that via the chat function at the bottom of the screen, where we'll be monitoring for them. We would like to know who you are and where you're from. So as you're comfortable, please type your name, organization, location, and email address into the chat, so you'll be included in announcements for future programs. One of the goals of today's webinar is, if you haven't done so already, please sign on to the Defund Racism campaign. Please sign on. You'll be hearing much more about it in the next hour. You'll want the updates and latest news as well as lending your name to this critically important effort. You can do that throughout the webinar today or any other time at the, uh, uh, at the web link that I have on the screen. And you can also make a contribution and you see that link there as well. And I'll be showing this slide uh, a number of times throughout the webinar. Before we introduce our three panelists, it's my pleasure to introduce our colleague, uh, Philip Farah. Uh, from the Palestinian Christian Alliance for Peace to say a few words. Philip? Assalamu alaikum, everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Uh, my name is Philip Farah. Uh, I'm with uh, a board member of the Palestinian Christian Alliance for Peace. Thank you so much for attending this really important uh, webinar. Uh, as Michael said, we intend for this to be more than just information. Uh, we want you to get involved both as individuals and as organizations. So uh, 
Michael has already uh, provided information on how you can sign on to the campaign and uh, contribute if you uh, have the uh, means to do so. Um, and uh, we'd like for you to join in. So uh, please, it's very important that we make this, uh, uh, th there, the campaigns have already been very active in New York, in Florida, Pennsylvania, and other places as you will hear, and we want to grow this movement. So thank you very much. Thank you, Philip. So we're fortunate today to have three expert panelists. Bana, Bana Abu Zuluf, researcher and community activist with the Good Shepherd Collective. Jonathan Brenneman, Palestinian American activist and defund racism organizer in New York State. And Mahmoud Zware, Palestinian co-founder of the Nonviolent Resistance Network, Pal Popular Struggle Coordination Committee. I'm going to ask each one of the participants to take three or four minutes to further introduce themselves and their work. Mahmoud, uh, tell us about the Popular Struggle Coordination Committee um, and uh, why this campaign, the Defund Racism campaign, is so important and why it's so important now. Thank you very much for this very important meeting that will uh, enable us as Palestinians to express to you what is happening on the ground in Palestine. Uh, I'm talking to you from the West Bank, from the city of Bethlehem. And uh, uh, I am here representing a grassroots organization uh, called uh, the Popular Struggle Coordination Committee that it was established back in 2009 in order to foster the resilience, to organize nonviolent resistance, and to protect the rights of the Palestinians, especially in the uh, occupied territories, uh, uh, which is categorized according to Oslo as Area C, which is under full Israeli occupation. Uh, the aim of our uh, uh, organization is to organize the protest to protect the land, to protect the people. And we managed to, pull, to mobilize many villages around nonviolent resistance. Yet we face the challenge, not only from the Israeli occupation uh, represented by the army, by the government, by all the uh, organs of the uh, Israeli government, but also from settlers. The Israeli settlers who are living in the occupied uh, Palestine. Those, uh, especially the one who are following the Palestinians in uh, the rural areas, such as the communities you mentioned in Jerusalem, in Jordan Valley, in South Hebron Hills, and many other locations. And that because our work is about land, about farmers, about shepherds, about protecting the existence of the Palestinians in these threatened areas, we are the first who are affected by the settlers who are attacking the Palestinians on their land. So they are the one who are occupying the hills in the West Bank. They are the one who are occupying the houses of the Palestinians. And that is exactly what we are doing to prevent the Israeli occupation among them settlers who are equipped with the resources and the money in order to do all of what they are doing. That's where we are here in order to say those settlers are the first and on the front line of the colonial project in the occupied West Bank and in Palestine in general, because they are the right wing that is implementing the policies of the state to annex the Palestinian lands. And our work as a grassroots movement is to mobilize Palestinians to foster their resilience in these communities in order to stop that from happening. We succeeded in many occasions to reroute the apartheid wall that Israel started to build back in 2004. We managed 
to bring life to many areas in, in, in the occupied West Bank and to foster the resilience of the people, to protect sh shepherds and farmers, to enable them access to, uh, to have access to their land. Challenging the settlers, resisting the settlers who are adopting the lifestyle of the Palestinians in these areas in order to take, to use every single mean to achieve their goal by connecting the settlements with each other. One day, while we were going to one of the communities in the South Hebron Hills, and when the, when the Israeli authorities confiscated the car of one of our uh, friends, the settlers passed with their four by four car. At that moment, we were looking at the double standard. On one hand, the army are following the Palestinian activists confiscating their resources, such, are their, uh, such as their vehicles and cars. While on the other hand, they are opening the roads for the settlers who are supplied unfortunately by taxpayers in Europe and in the US. Those people are not defending their rights. Those people are occupying our, our land. And here we are standing against that through our people, through a bottom up approach with the people that we are working when, with to adopt nonviolent resistance to end this occupation. Thank you, Mahmoud. Jonathan, you're working with the defund racism campaign in New York. We'll get into the details uh, of that in a little bit, but introduce us generally to you and your work and why this campaign, Jonathan, and why now? Thank you, Michael. And it's uh, so good to be here with all of you and be surrounded by uh, so many familiar faces and so many others who I do not yet know, but look forward to being in the struggle with, with you all. Thank you for being here for such an important webinar. Uh, I come to this, really, I, I need to start the story back 10 years ago when I was with Christian peacemaker teams, now known as community peacemaker teams, working to stop the Israeli colonization in uh, Hebron and the South Hebron Hills. And I remember traveling to those, to every single village in Misafar Yatta, uh, working with the popular committees there uh, to try to prevent this firing zone that Israel was proposing from um, being able to remove all of the Palestinians from their land. And as a uh, Palestinian Christian myself, that was something that was very deeply uh, uh, meaningful to me to be in that space and to see the resilience and the struggle of the Palestinians in the Safriyat particularly. So when I came back to the States, after being denied entry by the Israeli military and wanted to find ways to connect that work. I was always looking for ways to particularly support uh, Palestinians in the Safriyatta. And so when the call came out from the popular committees, they actually had something for us to do in the US. And that was that um, they recognized the charities in the US as we've already heard that are funding uh, these settlements. And so uh, it sounded like a really important way uh, recognizing that the that there's so much work to do in the U.S. that we could help support folks there answering their call, not saying here's what we think is the best thing to do, but actually hearing from people on the ground who say this is how this is what is hurting us and this is how you in the U.S., are complicit in that and how you can change. And I think that there is a very, that this is a very creative campaign and an incredibly strategic campaign. And so I was very excited when I was living in New York that that was one of the uh, first places that the defund racism campaign was working because of the particularities of that space, which I will get into later. But um, this is why coming from a uh, Christian background from a Palestinian Christian background um, that I wanted to make sure to uh, be a part of this particular campaign. Thank you, John, uh, Jonathan. And Bana, uh, you work directly with the Defund Racism campaign as part of the Good Shepherd Collective. You said, it's not enough to say settlements are illegal. Yes, we need to protest, 
the protests can't be just rah, rah, rah. They need to be connected to tactical structural change. What is it about this campaign, Bana, that does that? And why is it so important now? Um, thank you so much, Jim, Michael, and also thank you for the sponsors and co-sponsors. It goes without saying. Um, thank you all for inviting us. Um, uh, this is a great question. Um, one of the things that the Good Shepherd Collective, which is an anti-Zionist, anti-colonial organization, um, thinks of and believes is that we cannot always, uh, you know, uh, create discourse, educational, um, uh, you know, workshops, and eventually not do anything about this structure and about how, you know, these violent structures affect the, the community. So essentially it was about how do we develop praxis, praxis that is, uh, that could, you know, could uh, eventually uh, create possible change on the ground. So we partnered with um, local, um, with locals here, you know, different partners, including uh, uh, Mahmoud as well. Um, and, and many of these, uh, uh, you know, partners that we end up, you know, discussing how we can address such structures. The Defund Racism campaign is also one of our campaigns that target structures, specifically the financial structures that we've mentioned. Why this is important right now, I would say is because of two things. If you look at the uh, last year, May, when the events uh, in Sheikh Jarrah and Silwan happened, settler organizations were involved and are still involved. When we're talking about Misafir Yatta and what's happening in Misafir Yatta, settler organizations are involved. When we're talking about uh, what's happening in um, uh, the Naqab, uh, you know, um, uh, that's also uh, settler organizations like the JNF involved. And when we're talking about Bedouin communities in Khal and Ahmar, Regavim, a settler organization, is involved. So everything that is currently happening, that you look in Palestine and you just want to, uh, uh, you know, just research a little bit, you'll find that a settler organization is involved. This is important because people don't know the names of these uh, uh, settler organizations. They don't know that that, you know how they uh, you know uh, uh, you know create such uh, uh, you know uh, you know cycle of you know receiving funding from the U.S. or other you know sources and using that money to uh, create settlements to uh, you know force you know civil administration Israeli civil administration to target Palestinian houses and demolish them uh, to uh, to create legal battles against Palestinians. Uh, on different pretexts, uh, including that they're, you know, uh, you know, settling on, you know, uh, state land, Israeli state land. So there are a lot of these settler organization involvement in the uh, uh, in the indigenous erasure in Palestine. So this is why it's uh, essential. The second reason is because the defund racism campaign is a campaign that you know, a lot of people that are not in uh, a Palestine can be part of. So if you're in the US and you can be, you want to do something for Palestinians, then you can say like, hey, I don't want my money to be sent to these settler organizations. You have the choice to make a difference in these communities by uh, making sure to halt the, the transfer and the flow of money of these charitable, supposedly charitable organizations and pro uh, Zionist organizations to these settler organizations here that uh, target uh, Palestinian uh, structures and, 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 you know, create uh, this, you know, cycle of indigenous erasure. Thank you very much, all three of you. You know, I, I don't know that we want to spend a lot of time on this, but since it was just last week, I I do want each one of you to say a word about President Biden's time in Israel, in which he called himself a Zionist. Yesterday, in yesterday's news, one Palestinian official called it the, the Trump years with a smile. Um, uh, maybe, maybe the maybe to connect it with defund racism. Talk, talk about connect the dots for us. Connect uh, his visit, his time in Israel, with the defund racism campaign. Does it make your work that much more difficult? Uh, does it give us a focal point? Talk about that, each one of you. Jonathan, why don't you start for us? I mean, for me, there's very little surprising about Biden's visit to, to Israel. Um, 
you know, the U.S. federal government has been the most pro-Israel and pro-colonial government in the world. Um, this is something all of us already knew. Uh, and so I had no hopes for Biden at all. And I think it's clear, like, governments are not going to save us on this, especially federal governments. And so I, one of the things that I appreciated about the defund racism campaign is that it was looking at other leverage points that we have. Uh, so defunding these settlements doesn't take the work necessarily of the U.S. government. It doesn't take right. a president. It doesn't take Congress. Yeah. We're looking at other leverage points that we have that are, I think, in the long term, going to move those targets as well. And in the short term, have direct impacts on making it harder to remove Palestinians from their homes. Thank so you. this is why I'm excited about the campaign. Thank you. Uh, Bana, do you want to say a word? Or, I mean, you don't have to, but would you like to say a word? Um, I would. I would want to say something. To be honest, it was... Um, it was, uh, I mean, it, you just uh, explained it. I mean, Biden said he's a Zionist. So it, I don't think we need uh, we need to dwell on it a lot. I think it's just, you know, as the Good Shepherd Collective, as the campaign as well, we have a clear stance on Zionism. We're anti-Zionist. We have explained that in, uh, uh, you know, our posts on social media and also on, uh, on our website as well. And, you know, this case of, you know, believing that there would be some kind of uh, accountability uh, that comes with, uh, you know, Biden's visit. Um, obviously, we had we had we didn't have any kind of uh, belief or faith uh, because, um, you know, Israel and, um, and the US are, you know, great allies. And, you know, there's no reason for us to believe that justice will come through that uh, now eventually like we'll we'll we're kind of at least you know a bit uh, a bit you know caught and cautious about why that other progressives in the congress aren't doing or saying much about the visit they're kind of a, a somewhat ignoring the discussion about the visit specifically the visit to the west bank so we're kind of a, you know we don't expect much of biden but we also expect a little bit more of the progressives that have promised or have said uh, you know a lot of pro palestinian or have had you know a lot of pro palestinian stances in the past thank you mahmoud Yes, I would say, uh, first of all, thanks to Biden that we lived under siege for 24 hours in Bethlehem. No movement was allowed for people because a VIP person is coming to Palestine, to Bethlehem. Churches, mosques, streets, shops were closed because of Biden's visit. And we saw the helicopters over the refugee camps landing in Bethlehem. To, to welcome him for 30 minutes just to evict the people from the Church of Nativity and to let him have a, a visit there. I would say it's more about public relations and to have the red carpet for, for Biden in, uh, in Bethlehem without any political impact. At least this time, he's saying that we cannot see in the scene that a two-state solution is uh, is, is coming soon. This is what he was uh, saying, but let's say, as Jonathan was saying, let's start with what is in between our hands. What is between our hands is what we can change, where the people can say we can stop funding settlers' actions on the ground. Biden never able to do anything for this if I want to stop funding those settlers. Biden will never uh, uh, stop us from uh, giving, uh, from uh, stopping funding the, the uh, settler organizations. That's why I think always bottom up people uh, to people is much more powerful uh, in, 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 in building peace and ending occupation, apartheid, whatever we want to call. That's my, my uh, how I see, I see it. I have no hope that the American government will do a change towards that. Thanks to uh, all three of you. We're, we're gonna get into the details, uh, Bana, in, in a minute, but I would like for you to address a question 
and I'll give the other two uh, panelists a chance to respond too. Most of us in the U.S. you know get uh, our opposition to house demolitions, to dispossession of the land, but I want you to connect the dots very, very directly for us about how racism plays a role. This campaign isn't about defunding uh, 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 house demolition campaigns, or you know those are uh, uh, pro-refugee, you know, pro-return of refugees. This is defund racism. Why, why are these charitable, charitable organizations racist in their funding of settler organizations? Make, make that connection for us as explicit as you can. Thank you. Um, that's a question that we've had actually quite before of, you know, even the name, like the defund racism, like why have you chosen that? I think an element that uh, we emphasize in our, um, in our, you know, you know, webinars and on our website as well is the intersectionality element. Um, when we previously, you know, discussed like the, the name of the campaign, it was going to be like defund settler organizations. It's not going to work as a campaign name, right? But uh, but then we realized, in fact, that this goes beyond Palestine. Actually, this goes a bit larger. At least in the U.S., we can easily map out a lot of these, you know, organizations that fund like white supremacy, uh, you know, other types of, you know, racisms. Uh, I would say so. So we thought if our campaign would have, you know, that effect, we thought it was important for us to to use that, you know, intersectional element of defunding racism. Now, of course, these uh, organizations here on the ground, like there's, it goes without saying that they're racist. But when we say that it gets, it receives funding from these charities, it almost feels like you would expect charities to be, you know, to think a bit deeper about where they would send their money. But when, when we have charities that are specifically created to send in money just for these organizations, and while they know, of course, and we're saying like how it's explicitly, you know, carried out and, uh, you know, put on their website as well. Like, so it's public stuff. So if you go to the settler organization's website and we have on our, uh, on our website, defundracism.org, which you'll have in the chat, we have the names of these organizations and the website. You can just go in there and see the amount of racist rhetoric that they have and, and just the amount of, uh, of, disillusioned members you know you'd go to the blogs and you'd see someone i'm quoting of course right now uh that palestinians are uh the um, the uh, pa the palestinians are the western white uh colonizers what how it's just disillusion it's conspiracy theories it's an, and it goes without saying it it doesn't even get criticized there's no critical element of what's happening there nobody's being critical of what's on these websites and including the charitable organizations supposedly sending money and believing that it's being used for educational activities when obviously stated on the website of these settler organizations that they're not and that they're carrying out things that would be described as violent. So, you know, racism does not go out without violence. It is necessarily about violence. And in this case, structural violence that goes beyond even Palestine. And it goes way uh, uh, broadly, at least ways, you know, in ways that are intersectional. Mahmoud, thank you. Mahmoud, would you like to respond? Why defund racism? Because the racism is on the ground. Because on daily basis, we are living the racism and the discrimination uh, between Palestinian between Palestinian and those and those uh, settlers who are living in Palestine. Let me give you an example. Even this racism, not only among, uh, against Palestinians, but also against Israeli activists who are joining the struggle of the Palestinians. Uh, a few uh, a month ago, those settlers uh, is, is smashed the car of an Israeli activist, and uh, the, the Israeli woman were filming when the settlers unmasked uh, smashed her car, injuring her. And we approached, she approached the commander and she told him, 
according to Geneva Convention, you are the, uh, the, uh, the power on the ground and you should protect these people and including myself as an Israeli. He told her, no way, I am here to protect my people. So that is racism. That is in a way, those practices on the ground that we see is exactly fit with the definition of racism. When you distinguish between people and uh, implementing different laws on them, and you are with one side against the other. And why this, fund, uh, this, uh, this uh, campaign is crucial for the Palestinians. If those settlers continue with the crimes that they are conducting against Palestinians, against the nature, against everything in Palestine, then the, 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 of course there will be a, a cover for them by the Israeli army. Let me give you an example. Back in the days, um, uh, four or five years ago, settlers burned the, a Palestinian house. Those groups of settlers funded from US uh, uh, burned the house, causing the killing of a father and his child. Burned, they were burned in the house. And the army arrested them uh, and now they are their prison is like a, a five stars hotel so these this is the racism this is the discrimination be, uh, uh, between them now why it is connected also uh, on the ground with what we are doing if uh, and by the way they are uh, covering themselves with different nationalities for example when they come and approach a palestinian community with a good face they pretend that they are americans they pretend that they are europeans and they exploit the hospitality of the palestinians for what to see if there is any construction to see how many uh, uh, how many water pipes are passing there to see everything and to film and to, to send to the Israeli army in order to urge them to destroy these infrastructures then that maintain the life of the Palestinians in these areas. They also adopt, uh, they also adopt the, the fake organizations in Canada in different cases as what happens in the church between Hebron and Bethlehem that now is for one of the settlers. So this, this is racism in a way with through their practices that they are implementing against the Palestinians and even against the Israeli activists who are fighting with the Palestinians for their rights. Thank you, Mahmoud. Jonathan, defund racism. I think Bana and Mahmoud uh, have really already said it, that like, it's just very clear that what, just what settlements are is a racist entity, right? Like this is discriminatory housing. We've seen that in this country, we continue to see it in this country, and we're seeing it on steroids in Palestine. Uh, and so recognizing, it helps us recognize the connections when we put it in that frame of racism. Thanks, Jonathan. I have now. I have now some questions for each one of you. Um, so, Jonathan, uh, let me start with you. It's shocking the amount of so-called charitable money that flows into these organizations. Uh, according to a 2015 hours report, now I, I understand that's seven years ago, but uh, I got this from the uh, from the uh, Defend Racism website. Over 50 501c3 organizations, tax-exempt U.S. charities, funneled over $200 million to Israeli settlements. So I don't know if you have any updated statistics, but uh, if, if I want to give money to a Palestinian organization, it's virtually impossible to get money to them directly. I mean, I know many groups, right, that have to take cash in their pockets to give to a Palestinian organization in Bethlehem, for example, you know, is working nonviolently with children. And yet these settler groups are awash with and have no trouble getting U.S. tax exempt money. How does that happen? Great question. Yeah, I mean, the, the racism <laughs> isn't just in Israel, right? It extends to the U.S. as well. Absolutely. And so you, so exactly what you're talking about, Michael, We've seen tax law be used against Palestinian organizations over and over and over and over again. 
while uh, organizations that are funding illegal, like actually funding illegal activity are given a pass. They're just not um, investigated. There's a lot that we don't know about the funding of these organizations. Uh, before being part of this campaign, I've also done a lot of work with Christian Zionist organizations. Those ones consider themselves churches and are even more opaque in their financial giving. Uh, so we have a lot of different kinds of organizations that are able to give a lot of money with almost no oversight at all. Uh, and so one, one of the reasons why this is such an interesting campaign is that we're finally trying to get an investigation started. For years, actually, Palestinian organizers have been trying to get the IRS to open an investigation on these groups, but the IRS at the federal level isn't interested in doing it. And basically the way that tax law works is it depends on if those in charge actually want to investigate or not. Other than that, you're going to get away with it. You know, uh, so what's unique about the defund racism campaign is that they recognize there's another potential target here because all of these uh, charitable organizations are also uh, under the responsibility of state governments as well. So a state attorney general could start an investigation, could demand some of this, or this information that we're unable to actually get right now, and could see because it's very clear that not only are they funding illegal activity, they're also probably pretty corrupt. <laughs> Uh, so there's there's a lot here. There's a lot of potential Absolutely. here if people are willing to actually look. And so far, our governments have not been. And so we're going after attorney generals that have, because this is an elected position, and we're looking at ones specifically that have bases that are maybe more progressive than they are, or that understand Palestine a little bit better where they, the, so that they can feel that they have the political cover to actually start an investigation. And let's see what they turn up. You know, uh, Jonathan, uh, we're gonna give you a chance in just a minute to talk about specifically the New York AG and your work there. Uh, but before we do that, uh, Mahmoud, you have said that, quote, Israel settler organizations impact every Palestinian. So I'm going to mention some of the areas impacted by this so-called charitable money. And I'd like for you and Bana briefly, because we've got, we, we have a few of them to talk about them. And I want you to name names. We're very interested in, in these so-called charitable organizations in this country and their connections in Israel. So I want you to name names, give us examples of how, these 501c3 groups like Regavim and Elad and the Israel Land Fund and Ataret Kohanim and others are using tax-exempt U.S. contributions to oppress Palestinians in each one of these areas. So let me name a few and then give kind of your quick hits maybe and some exam and an example or two. So Atuani Masaf Yata, uh, I just read Sami Hureini, who we've interviewed here before, from Youth of Samud was recently detained there again, and the South Hebron Hills, that, that area. Uh, 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 Mahmoud and then Bana. So yeah, now uh, with the South Hebron Hills, there are these different organizations, settler organizations that they are working on the ground in order to, uh, to annex the Palestinians from, from that area. They don't want to see any Palestinian there. First of all, they are chopping the trees, the olive trees in the area. Many times they uh, chopped the trees in Atwani and in Masafariata in general. Secondly, they attacked shepherds and their livestock everywhere in Masafariata, uh, causing the death. Back in uh, 28th of September 2021, a group of 40 settlers gathered in one of the hamlets in the South Hebron Hills. They stabbed six uh, goats for a, for a shepherd and they attacked the entire village, causing the injury of a child of four years old. And they smashed his skull and he spent a week in the ICU in an Israeli hospital. 
and the Israelis, uh, the Israeli uh, didn't let the Palestinian ambulance to take it and they sent it to an Israeli hospital. And until now the case is going on. Another uh, case is that all the demolishing orders that you see and the demolishing that's taking place is as a result of, of the Israeli settlers organizations uh, uh, there. I'll give you one example, the equipments, that they have drones, uh, technology, cars, uh, uh, all the facilities are from the money that they are receiving. The and which, drone, group, which, which uh, charitable organization, so-called, is funding the, these efforts? What, is there a particular one or are there a number of them? There, there is the, uh, the, the Ragavim that is taking main, yeah. the uh, infrastructure issues in South Hebron Hills. Their drones are 24 seven on the villages of Masafir Yatta. If you bring one basket, the army will come and check what is it, what it is because of Ragavim uh, uh, activities. And lastly, the uh, shepherd uh, settlers who came to occupy the, the, the hills of South Hebron Hills. Let me give you like, they buy the sheep for them. They offer them cars. They offer, th offer them mobile uh, big t v vans to settle in and to stay in the in the uh, in the top of the hills. Solar panels, uh, everything they offer them for those uh, Israeli settlers to stay in groups in order to occupy these hills and to prevent the Palestinian shepherds from reaching that areas. And on top, I would say, and I am not here, the attacking that is happening and taking place in front of the Israeli army. They are con uh, conducting uh, uh, cr crimes and attacking in front of the Palestinian, uh, of the Israeli army, as happened one month ago in uh, one Palestinian town when the, an Israeli settler stabbed a Palestinian and killed him in front of the army. Thank you. So these uh -huh. are examples of what they are doing, Ragavim and the price tag uh, organizations in South Hebron Hills. Bana, I'm going to ask you about Silwan in just a minute. But before I do, I want to just re remind everyone, now is the time to go to defundracism.org to support the defund racism campaign and receive their mailings. And please, please consider making a contribution. You see the link on the screen. I'm gonna leave it up here for just another minute, but uh, please uh, consider making a contribution. Bana, uh, if you don't mind talking while this is up on the screen here, just for another minute, uh, tell us a little bit about uh, Silwan and how these so-called charitable organizations are impacting the people there. Yes, uh, thank you, Michael. Um, so in the case of Silwan, there are two uh, uh, settler organizations that are mainly um, you know, targeting uh, Palestinian presence. The first is the Israel Land Fund and the second is Atarit Kohanim. Now, uh, Israel Land Fund, uh, uh, sorry, um, Al Ad, not Atarit Kohanim, uh, Ir David. So uh, in the case of uh, Israel Land Fund, uh, just so it's uh, easier for folks here who want to know a bit more, there is an AJ Plus uh, a video that came out uh, in collaboration with the Defend Racism campaign. And they described, uh, you know, exactly how this money, you know, gets sent into uh, this Israeli uh, land fund. And then eventually it gets uh, involved in the displacement effort of the Salam family in Silwan. So this is it's pretty clear. It's very uh, it's very like easy to see how this uh, you know how this works. If people are interested to know a bit of an example of how it works, then I would suggest going to the AJ Plus uh, short documentary video uh, that's also available on their website, and hopes hopefully someone will link that in in the chat box. Um, give us second, that website. What, give us that website one more time, please. Um, it's it's uh, it's not a website. It's AJ Plus, I would say. Oh, AJ um, Plus. Yes, okay. yes. 
Um, the second way, uh, the second set of organization is um, uh, Ir David or Elad. So Ir David is um, is a set of organization that is actually the biggest, uh, is in like funds. They receive the most money out of the five organizations that we are uh, listing in our, on our website. Uh, Al Ad, uh, you know, receives money from Friends of Al Ad in uh, New York and also um, other organizations outside, including the uh, Abraham uh, Abraham Romanovich. Uh, I forgot his Abramovich. Sorry, Abra Romanov Abramovich. Abramovich, who's the I'm not sure exactly about his name, but he's the he used to be the head of Chelsea Football Club. Um, and he used to send, uh, uh, you know, uh, hundreds of millions of dollars um, a year to Elad, and also the friends of um, Ir David and Elad in New York sends tons of money. So how they do this is that um, they are, uh, you know, in collaboration with the Ministry of Interior and Antiquities as well, the Ministry of Antiquities as well, uh, um, to uh, to create uh, parks uh, in Silwan and specifically David, as in like the city of David. So basically claiming kind of religious connection. So we argue that this is a type of faith washing again, because it's using the element of, you know, stealing homes in the name and pretext of faith and you know religious reasoning so that's of course so, you know one of the reason why i urge a lot of you know christians in the us to look into these you know because you know some of them they end up coming here on tours and they end up even visiting that place not realizing that this is one of the tactics that uh, el ad uses to demolish palestinian home and to uh, you know remove palestinians from from the presence of the area um, in east jerusalem uh, area of silwan um, so these two organizations are actually, be, uh, you know, funded by uh, the the Central Fund of Israel in the U.S., which has the 501c3 status and is located in um, in um, uh, New York. So all the five organizations actually receive money from the state of New York, uh, from the organizations in the state of New York. I'm going to come back to you, Bana, um, uh, and then I'll come back to Mahmoud for another one. But uh, talk to us about Sheikh Jarrah. Uh, there, you know, there's that famous video of uh, Settler, his last name is Fauci, Yako Fauci, telling Muna al Kurd, if I don't steal your house, someone else is going to steal it. So that's the justification, right? Uh, uh, but talk to us about uh, the settler organizations that are threatening uh, uh, Sheikh Jarrah and the charitable organizations supporting them. Uh, Bana, please. Oh, yes. Thank you. I, I didn't know if it was for Mahmoud. Um, but yeah, yeah. Um, Sheikh Shira has also been targeted by the Israel Land Fund, fund Etirat Kohanim. And they uh, are also targeted by uh, plenty of other organizations, settler organizations that aren't listed on our um, website and aren't part of this because of the strategic element of uh, targeting specifically the state of New York. Uh, now, uh, uh, you could easily actually uh, look this up as well. Um, we have also information on this um, in uh, the video that Mohammed al Kord has uh, on our website. So you can find a bit more information on that. Uh, now, uh, this this video, in fact, actually, this is an interesting point, because we've been saying this a lot about how, you know, the process of, you know, an American coming in and becoming a settler and actually stealing Palestinian how, like, homes, you know, like the process doesn't seem as, you know, um, you know, as I would say crazy, to be quite honest, um, until until, you know, it comes off as, you know, someone actually saying, like, if I don't, you know, settle, someone else will. So, you know, it made it clear. It made it clear how the process works. It made it clear how, you know, uh, uh, anybody from the U.S., anybody from any, you know, anywhere outside the world, as long as, long as they're Zionist, as long as they're Jewish, they can come in here and claim land and they'll be protected by the state. They'll be supported legally and financially by settler organizations organizations and allowed to settle in on Palestinian land. 
So that was important because, you know, sometimes what we, what do we call the useful idiot? You know, sometimes <laughs> people end up, you know, saying things and you're like, thank you for saying that, you know, like even Biden saying that he's a Zionist and that not every, you know, uh, you know, not only like, you don't have to be a Jewish person to be a Zionist. So like, that's what we're trying to say, you know, because of the allegations of anti-Semitism again. So like, it's very, very like, you know, sometimes like these things that people say end up, you know, being useful. So people are saying, here it is, see it. This is how it works. And this is exactly an example of even how settler organizations actually work. They bring about these people. They, it doesn't, you know, because they, they give them support, financial support, legal support. They tell them, hey, if you have trouble because of the illegal Arab squatters, then we'll help you legally. We'll give you financial legal support to file a lawsuits against these people. Now, of course, the, the people living there wouldn't have resources to do anything because it's very expensive and they end up losing their house because of that. And of course, it's a process that isn't individual. It's a, it's a systematic process. Thank you, Bana. Mahmoud, this one's for you. One month ago today, uh, I, I had a group uh, and we visited with E. Jahaleen, one of the village elders in Kanal Amr. Uh, the Bedouin community. Talk to us about the Bedouin, the Bedouin situation throughout the West Bank and the settler organizations and uh, uh, the charitable organizations funding these groups. Yeah, thank you for this question. Actually, we call the Bedouins as the candles of the desert mm -hmm. uh, because they are the one who uh, are protecting the, the rural areas and sometimes prevent the settlement expansions. And of course, Israel uh, is aware of this. That's, that's why the story of the Palestinian Bedouins who were expelled from their land in 1948 and is scattered to the east uh, uh, hills of the West Bank from South Hebron Hills up to the north in the Jordan Valley, are founding them, uh, themselves in a continuous Nakba after 74 years. So those, uh, those Bedouins who, you know, rely on uh, their livestock and uh, spreading on the, uh, on the areas, the first of all, these settler organizations founded uh, the, the shepherd settlers who are restricting their movement and they prevent them from grazing the sheep in different areas. This is in parallel with the displacement tactique that the Israeli government is using against the Bedouins. And the last example is, is Al-Khan al-Ahmar. When the Israeli government decided to, to displace them, forcibly displace, uh, displace them in another location, and at the same time, there is a settler just living a few meters from Al Khan al Ahmar in a tent, yep. and they yep. did nothing to him. On the contrary, they supplied him with electricity, with roads, and everything. So that is uh, the, the situation in a way that Bedouins, when I'm talking about the nature, the lifestyle of these people when they displaced them, Israel tried to reallocate the Bedouins in, in Israel itself. And they noticed how this causes social uh, conflicts and how this changing the lifestyle, how it is impacting on the social uh, relations between, between people, women role in society and all of that. And of course, in West Bank, it's a different story. So they lit the hands of these organizations, settler organizations, to do the job on behalf of the government. So they are following every sector of the Palestinian uh, society, whether farmers, and they know how they are doing it, Bedouins, and also people living in the cities like Jerusalem. And, uh, and Bana was talking about Sheikh Jarrah. So the faces, all of these activities that the settlers are doing needs resources. So when they claim that they bought these houses or they own these houses, the legal process costs, the lawyers costs. So who covers these costs 
are the taxpayers in the US. So Bedouins, again, when, when we manage, it's about political opportunities in a way, when, when they stop according to the US uh, pressure and the European Union pressure, uh, that came after the people's pressure to stop reallocate uh, the, the forcible displacement of the Al Khan Al Ahmar Bedouins. This uh, process is not stopping, but it is not on the scene as we saw in Al Khan Al Ahmar on daily basis. Suleiman Al Hadalin, a Palestinian Bedouin who were expelled from his vill- uh, his town in nineteen 19- in Israel and was uh, uh, and lived in Umm Al Khair community in South Hebron Hills was killed by the police and they considered that as a car accident. So Bedouins, if you siege them and they do not give them the spaces to graze their sheep, then they will become a problem because they are, this is the only thing that they can do, grazing sheep, being in the mountains, being on the hills, in the landscape, but with what settlers are doing, when they attack their livestock, when they prevent them from reaching the, the fields, to graze their sheep, when they poison the water yeah. of the water wells uh, to kill their sheep, when the Israeli burn, when the settlers burn the crops, uh, the, the hay, the dry grass. So what these people will do? That's the, how these settler organizations are following. And on top, these settler organizations are urging The police of nature, they call it in Israel, I don't know the right English concept for this, to take the Palestinian sheep. They urge them to take the Palestinian Bedouin sheep. So they they want to dry the resources. So as Jonathan was saying, if you let me go back a step, they are drying the resources of life for the Palestinians and they are asking for more resources for them. Us in the PSCC, the Popular Struggle Coordination Committee, Israel recruiting uh, units of the army in order to see each single dollar where it is going, including our organizations when they manage to stop uh, us from receiving funds from EU and and the US as they claim that we are involved in violence while settlers are building peace in Palestine. Imagine. That's the equation. You know, Mahmoud, you you and the other panelists would be interested in this. We uh, So our group is sitting in the courtyard of the the school at Al Khan Al Amr, you know, with the, the built out of the tires and the, the mud and with the beautiful murals painted on the walls by the children. And Eid Jahanin points up to the neighboring hillside, maybe 100 yards away, 150 yards away. He said, once we're removed from here, the Israeli government is planning to put settlers on this hillside to recreate like a little theme park of a Bedouin community that will be staffed by settlers looking like Bedouins so Christian and Jewish and other tourists can come and see what Bedouin life is like. So, <laughs> I mean... Exactly, exactly. So anyway... Uh, um, um, Thank you for that. The candles of the desert. I, I did not know that before, so I, I appreciate you sharing that with us. Uh, thanks uh, for, and I know that there are other places throughout uh, the West Bank that we could talk about, and maybe you want want to pick up one or more of them in a little bit. But I want to ask Jonathan now, before it gets too late. Jonathan, you've mentioned a little bit about your work with the Defund Racism campaign in New York, but I want you to now drill down on this because We've had a number of questions about what can we practically do in the United States? So I want you to talk to us about some of your initiatives, some of the obstacles you faced, some of the lessons you've learned that will benefit the rest of us. And and I guess, Jonathan, the background question in this for me, how achievable is is this defund racism campaign? We, you all seem pretty optimistic that this is something we can do. So tell us how we can do this and what you've learned. Yeah, it is something we can do because like, it's kind of clear to everyone what charities are supposed to do. And it's actually in, in the law, like the idea is you have to, if you're a charity, you have to prove you're doing a public good. 
So, so long as we are allowing charities to be giving their money to the kinds of things that Mahmoud was just sharing about, it says that we consider ethnic cleansing of Palestinians a public good. That is a horrific statement. That is a horrific idea. And so it feels like convincing the right people of that shouldn't be so hard. But as we know with Palestine work, it's always hard. And so, like I said, the, there have been efforts to get the IRS to move on this, but the IRS both don't want to do it. And even if they did, their power is actually quite limited. So uh, in New York, um, answering the call of Palestinians, we recognize that the state attorney general would be a good target because specifically in New York, the attorney general, Letitia James, ran as a progressive. She's also been very willing to go after char so-called charities that are doing harmful work. Most famously, she's gone after uh, some of Donald Trump's quote-unquote charities, and she's gone after the NRA, nearly bankrupting them in the state of New York. Again, recognizing that not only are they doing a lot of bad stuff, but they're incredibly corrupt and actually got caught on some of the corruption issues that are illegal. So charities in the US have to prove they're doing public good and, over, and international charities actually have an even higher bar, uh, supposedly. But again, you have to get the attorney general to actually start an investigation. And while our attorney general is claiming to be progressive, it's still hard to get any elected politician to move on Palestine. So first we started with base building and education, getting people, not just the most progressive in New York City, but all across the state, uh, connecting various uh, Palestine solidarity groups to petition the governor to open an investigation. And actually we've opened that petition up to anyone in the country. So if you uh, have saved that link for defund racism, you'll see the petition that you can sign uh, to encourage the attorney general to open an investigation. And this then- is, for, Excuse me, Jonathan. So not just the defund racism campaign petition we can sign, but there's one for New York that's on the defund racism Camp, uh, campaign website as well? Or is it the same one? It's the same one. It's the, okay. the one we currently have is specifically for uh, the attorney general. Okay, thank you. Right. I just want to make sure. Uh, and and not, not, only, not only are we doing this grassroots base building, but we also recognize she's going to need political cover to open up an investigation. So uh, we're doing work with uh, organizations that are more advocacy focused to get uh, elected officials to say, we want the attorney general to open this investigation. So that there's also the political cover uh, for her to do the right thing, right? We're trying to make it as easy as possible for the attorney general to do the right thing, to open an investigation, to see what she finds. And we are pretty confident that this will, um, that there's enough breaches of charitable law uh, that these organizations should not be able to continue. Now, I will say charitable law is a slippery thing and there are all sorts of ways that, that uh, the attorney general could choose to not do it. So that's why we're taking a lot of time to base build, to get a lot of names on this petition, to get a lot of other electeds on board saying that this is something important to them because it will actually be an attorney general who wants this to happen, that will make it happen. Uh, and again, this is very specific to the state of New York, but we've seen people in other places replicate this with changes to their own, um, to their own context. And I can talk about that more if you'd like, but I'll uh, let you ask another question. <laughs> okay, thanks, Jonathan. You know, I, I just wanna, I wanna just reiterate that, um, um, most of us are on, on this call, most of us activists are good at educating our constituents about various issues. But really what's needed now is a coalition of individuals and organizations that's building a political movement, a grassroots political movement that actually makes change to laws or to apply the laws justly and fairly. And so, mm -hmm. um, 
I want to applaud all, all of our friends on, on, on the call here, right, for all the educational efforts. But uh, we really now are about uh, um, building a coalition of forces. And I guess now would be a good time, uh, Jonathan, before we, uh, we move forward with uh, some of the other states. One of the things that we organizers of this webinar have discussed is while education is important, um, we also need to build this kind of political movement. So um, um, if you're interested in being a part of that, we're going to be reaching out to all of you on the webinar in the next number of days and uh, inviting you to part two of this, uh, of this effort, where maybe uh, uh, those of you who are interested can gather together and begin strategizing uh, nationally, but, but particularly state by state, region by region, so we can learn from each other. So we can learn from each other. So Jonathan, your, your work in New York is critically important to us. You wanna say a word about Florida or Pennsylvania or California or other places quickly, and then I'll, I'll go to Mahmoud and Bana to begin wrapping things up. Yeah, I would, I would love to, because I think that a win in just one of these states makes it easier for the next person to do the same thing, to set that precedent that this is not okay. Um, and I mean, also a win to have even just an investigation open would really be the first time that anyone in the US actually enacted stated US policy that set settlements are not okay. So some administrations have said they're illegal. Some administrations have said they're a roadblock to peace, everything in between. But basically everyone has said, like, we do not support settlements. And yet the U.S. continues to support settlements. Yeah. So even if we can get one state's attorney general to actually act on that stated policy, that opens up the floodgates for others to do the same. So we have campaigns currently going in multiple states, and each one looks a little different. The one most similar to New York is one in California where uh, they have a relatively progressive attorney general that they think they can build a strong enough coalition to pressure. Uh, in Florida, they are, they're actually using the tactic of boycotts against duty-free Florida because the family that owns it is a major settlement funder. Huh. And going after individuals like that is also a strategy that um, in Pennsylvania, led by the Philly JVP, uh, they're going after a major uh, settlement donor who is also donating to some other far right um, policies in that state as well, making those connections of the way that racism against Palestinians and racism against people of color here in the United States are connected. Um, in Massachusetts, they're doing a similar thing, connecting with um, the charitable giving of uh, fidelity that gives to a variety of right-wing um, causes, including Israeli settlements, um, and try and challenging that organization by public outrage, specifically towards the organization. So in, in all of these different places, you know, there's probably an organization in your state that's doing, that is supporting Israeli settlements in one way or another. And there is a, are a variety of tactics that you can take as part of the defund racism campaign. Thanks, Jonathan. Uh, before we get to Mahmoud and, and Bana, maybe all three of you could answer this, or maybe you don't know. A question that, that's been raised is the presence of Christian Zionists in this movement. Uh, do, you, do any of you know specific Christian Zionist organizations uh, on which the defund racism campaign needs to focus? Uh, I can take that one because that was a, a major part of what I had uh, focused on before being part of the campaign. Currently, uh, because the campaign is specifically answering the call from Palestinians on the ground and looking specifically at the direct organizations uh, that are doing the most damage, uh, we are starting with the, the organizations that are listed on the Defund Racism website. However, I always think it's really important to point out 
the largest group of pro-Israel and specifically pro-settlement Absolutely. individuals and organizations in the U.S. are Christian Zionists. And I know that, that a lot of, there's a lot of the uh, PIN groups and other uh, Christian organizers on this call. And I think that this is something that you all can take up because, uh, because there is Christian funding going to settlements and it is even more shadowy than what we have uncovered. You have, a name, so, you have a name of an organization? Sure. Or... Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll give two examples. Uh, one is Christians United for Israel. Yeah. We know that, that they are, first of all, an incredibly corrupt uh, organization um, where the leadership has taken a lot of money that they shouldn't be taking and that they directly uh, fund settlements. There's actually a, uh, a sports complex in one of the Israeli settlements named after John Hege, the founder of Christians United for Israel. Like it's this blatant. And I mean, they'll talk about it. However, uh, they are not only a 501c3, they are considered a church. Right. So uh, they can hide all sorts of financial malfeasance and they're registered in Texas and have close to and the attorney general it would be basically political suicide for the attorney general to go after them. So we need to try other tactics there. Another organization is the International Fellowship of Christians. Christians and Jews. Yeah. Um, it just got a lot more um, recognition for how horrible it is due to a documentary that came out last year called Till Kingdom Come, I believe. Um, and, but that one uh, is actually registered in the state of Illinois. So there might be some pressure to put there, but that one is a huge multi-million dollar organization that funds all sorts of things, including specifically supporting Israeli settlements that are taking over Palestinian land. Thank um, you, Jonathan, for, thanks for that. And there's much work that needs to be done, much more work that needs to be done, and maybe a coalition of pin groups uh, can, can take that up as we uh, move forward. Mahmoud, uh, the PSCC has documented work. Uh, I read the I read the report uh, in Bilin, Nabisala, and other villages. But as you mentioned the other day to us, you're taking what you've learned there, and now you're creating initiatives such as Women in Resistance, Lifestyle as Resistance, focusing on a new phase in the South Hebron Hills. You want to just say a little bit more about your work there and how the Defund Racism campaign. Uh, connects. I mean, it's exciting work that you're about, and I want you to have a chance yeah. to tell us about. Yeah. So let, let's say, like, one of the uh, focus of the PSCC is not only on uh, direct action and uh, collective action, nonviolent actions, but also it is about advocacy. It is about documenting what is happening on the ground because we believe that this is a chain that's uh, supposed to be connected to each other. And what we did in the past with educational institutions, international organizations, as well as the community-based organizations in order to see how we are going to foster and mobilize people towards nonviolent resistance. Uh, now uh, that was done because let's say like the nonviolent movement in Palestine is waving uh, from top to down, same as many other movements all over the world. Uh, and repression is also one of the arguable issues regarding the impacts on, on movements and repression is used by Israel many times. And at this stage, we are shifting to uh, the Jordan Valley, to the South Hebron Hills, to the villages there that became in the mouth of the settlements. Yeah. Uh, in a way that also we are focusing on stories on the ground with individual farmers, individual shepherds, individual small communities that are now sieged by, by settlements and by, by uh, settlers. Here at, at this stage, when we are uh, doing that, we are breaking the, by connecting what we are doing with the different racism is we are breaking one of the chains that the and the pillars that the oppressor are using against us as oppressed people, as people uh, are living under occupation. So such a uh, thing is important for us to weaken, to break these pillars that uh, easily can be targeted, especially when it comes 
to settlers who are receiving funds from uh, U.S. residents, taxpayers in the U.S. So with this campaign, you are fostering our movement on the ground. You uh, and we can also provide you with the information about the violations that those settlers are committing, uh, conducting against the Palestinians on the ground. So, for, for example, South Hebron is uh, east of Ramallah, the Jordan Valley, and all of these. It's the move that we are focusing on. In addition to the campaigns that we are supporting farmers in the threatened areas that uh, to pick their olives. So we have Faz'a campaign that is uh, to recruit Palestinians, Israelis, and internationals to support uh, uh, farmers in their uh, olive harvest. And do you think, who is, who is attacking the, the Palestinian farmers? They are those uh, members of this organization, settler organization. Just to give you an example, yesterday they burned tens of olive, ancient olive trees south of Nablus in a village Nablus. called Burin. And when the people come out angry uh, to to turn uh, to 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 stop the fire from spreading in the fields, the army followed them in their homes and they arrested the the, the youth from from the village. So this is the situation. That's why breaking this pyramid of support from the U.S. is important to. Uh, strengthen the nonviolent movement in Palestine. That is uh, crucial to understand what is beyond or your individual actions as a U.S. citizen towards building peace in the Middle East. That's the first step you can do. You are the one who can decide whether I want to contribute to human rights violations and to support settler organizations or not, based on my values, based on what I believe in. And when we are talking about racism, it's a global issue. It's not only exist in Palestine. So starting from our values, starting from our commitment to our humanity, is, is, is starts from this individual action that we are going to take in this campaign. It is the same as the, the climate change and the environmental changes that is taking a pl a pl place now. Europe is burning 40 degrees now. This is somehow when we take care of, uh, of this in the US, it reflects on us. Same as when I plant an olive tree, the oxygen this olive tree is produced will go to the children of the US and Israel and all over the world to breathe it. That's why we have to have these common values. When I take action as an individual, this will help us to build the movement that you are talking about, Mikhail. Thank you so much, Mahmoud. Bana, uh... <clears throat> You're working with Good Shepherd Collective. Uh, you're uh, also one of the organizers of the Defund Racism campaign. You have a uh, uh, hundred uh, activists and leaders of organizations here on this call. Tell us what you want us to do today and what we can do tomorrow and in the weeks to come. So give us our marching orders. Tell us how we can be involved. Thank you so much. I think I would like to say three things, just, just to be clear. The first is, I think the, the example that uh, Mahmoud mentioned about Khan al-Ahmar is essential. The international community was able to stop uh, uh, the demolitions of Khan al-Ahmar, which was going to be the demolition of the whole community. Right. And that is, of course, the, the first case in, you know, in even 1967 of demolishing, like de uh, demolishing the whole community. We're not saying about a house or two, the whole community. Um, but, however, um, you know, recently have, there have been talks about, you know, you know, going back to the same route and just uh, demolishing the house again the houses again so like international pressure is not enough um we need to make sure that we're doing something uh, more effective we're, we're we're more strategic and that's where the defund racism comes so i feel like people who uh want to be involved with the defund racism campaign they need to think of it this way it's about connecting both international efforts of advocacy to you know in, in pressure um, and also, you know, uh, to target financial structures and also violence structures as well. So we need to be strategic and also things that you can do in your 
poems as well. So you don't have to be in Palestine to be involved. The second thing I would like to mention is that I did include the link tree in the in the chat box, but I would also post it again. Um, we have a bunch of action points that we think like might be helpful for people that would like to have like certain action points to relate back to their groups if they're part of organizations and also to, to their constituents as well. Um, including you know uh, the petition of course but also the there's another petition to uh, for uh, Sammy Hirani who's you know obviously you know uh you know his house is under demolition order and you know we would like to support you know him directly so this is very important if you haven't signed that petition to do so and we have also other you know elements of you know campaigning you could also write letters to the congress and also write letters to uh, Letitia James. And you know, there are multiple, multiple uh, ways that you can be part of uh, this campaign. Uh, now, if you have, you're have you part of an organization and your organization ha hasn't endorsed the, the Defund Racism System campaign, there's an endorse uh, button on the website that you can um, go there and, you know, of course, discuss if you have the authority to discuss uh, with your, um, you know, group that you want, you would like to endorse the campaign. And then we can look for ways we can, you know, organize together. Um, the third uh, thing is that I honestly loved the, the, the enthusiasm around this, um, this, uh, you know, targeting these Christian Zionist organizations. I think that's a, that's a really good strategy. And I think there's, there's not a proper, you know, uh, uh, community of, you know, organizations than this, than the people here today with us to actually start strategizing about how they can uh, look at the, you know, 990 forms, the tax forms of these orgs, start looking at, you know, which, uh, which uh, organizations here, uh, um, sorry, which um, uh, communities here are, are being affected. And then we here, the Good Shepherd Collective, can be the connecting point to the people here on the ground, the, 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 the communities and the people affected by these Christian Zionist organization funding of these settler organizations here and the, uh, the funding of the settlement. So we can think together, we can create uh, uh, another element of the defund racism campaign in your own states. And it doesn't necessarily have to be in New York. Again, we have uh, multiple works in different states. The, the thing is, is that right now we are, you know, we're focusing on New York, but we have many, many people involved in the defund racism campaign that have their own strategies in their own states. Uh, and I think that, uh, you know, Jonathan kind of summed up the perfectly that, you know, Christian Zionists are pretty much really deep into this, you know, issue of funding. And it even it's it's quite even worse because it's it's a lot of the times churches and it's a lot of the times they're not even charitable organizations. And it's a lot of the times you cannot even find those missing pieces. And, and it needs to come from Christian organizations like the organizations that are, you know, um, you know, that think, you know, that justice is possible and then believe that ensuring accountability is important. And that needs to come from Christian organizations. And that would be really powerful. So I hope that you would go to the Defund Racism campaign. If you haven't signed a petition, please do. And also sign the petition for Sammy because, you know, we, we think Sammy it's Sammy Hurani, Yusuf yes. Samud. Yusuf yes, Samud. Yusuf Sammy Samud. Yes, thank you so much, Michael. Well, thank you, Bana. Uh, I, I want to give you and Mahmoud and Jonathan um, uh, a chance to offer some closing thoughts. But before we do, I want to just highlight the uh, the website one more time and a way to make a contribution. Go to the website and just like Bana and everyone has said, sign the petition as an individual and as the leader of your organization, sign the uh, uh, petition and make a contribution uh, right now. Next, uh, before we close with uh, our three panelists, I want to invite Reverend Allie Perry from the United Church of Christ Palestine Israel Network to say a few words. Allie? Yes, thank you, Michael. And thank you to our panelists so much. Really appreciate what you've uh, presented to us. I um, want to reinforce and underline everything you've said about how we can be involved and take action. And just emphasize that as somebody who's involved in the PIN, 
often we say, okay, we're good at passing resolutions, but how do we translate that into action? How do we engage at the grassroots? And this is a really critical way that we can do that. So I'm very grateful I urge everybody to go to the action steps that Ben um, pointed us to in the website. And if you haven't already contributed during the course of this webinar, as soon as it's over, I hope you will. And also just to emphasize the uh, organizational endorsement as well as the individuals. So that's really critical. And I appreciate so much our panelists and everybody being part of this. And Michael, thank you for facilitating. All right, Allie, thank you. And um, so let's, uh, uh, I wanna again, thank the Good Shepherd Collective, the United Church of Christ, Palestine, Israel Network, the Palestinian Christian Alliance for Peace, Indiana Center for Middle East Peace, FASNA, Israel-Palestine Mission Network of the Presbyterian Church USA, the U.S. Campaign for Palestinian Rights, and ICAD USA for sponsoring today's webinar. So some closing thoughts. Mahmoud? I, I, in, in a few words, I want to say that what we are doing is something great. Keep going. We don't know when the cup will be full. Each drop is important for us. And that's why we want to accumulate on what we are doing to achieve our goals. And we, we can do it. Keep mobilized, keep going. And we are, we will remain, we will remain steadfastness on our land. And I want to quote a shepherd. When he told me, when there are internationals with us, while I'm grazing my sheep, I feel my voice all over the world. Thank you again for organizing this great event. Thank you, Mahmoud, and thank you for all the work you're doing um, on the ground. Um, we really appreciate it and, and look to you as a wise guide. Jonathan? You're muted, Jonathan. There I, you go. I want Mahmoud's words to be the final words. That was beautiful. Yeah, every, every drop of water counts, and we have a responsibility. I just want Thank to repeat you. what he said. Thank you. Bana. Um, I would like to thank, of course, everyone for attending this webinar. Um, it means a lot to see this kind of support. And the fact that we have allies that are willing to show true solidarity means a lot. Um, specifically those days that things are hard in Masafir Yatta, and we appreciate everyone's support, even if in just words, but um, the fact that you, you know, now have, you know, you know, elements of, you know, actions that you can actually take and that you're willing to do so means a lot to us. So uh, we're very thankful and we think like, if anybody is interested in volunteering with us and being part of any of our working groups and being, you know, starting a new uh, chapter of this uh, Defund Racism campaign, we are happy uh, to include you. We welcome you all and we thank you all for this amazing webinar and for the kindness that you showed us. Defund, thank you, Bana. Defundracism.org. Defundracism.org. Go there, sign the petition become involved. I want to say thank you to someone who we haven't seen on the screen, and that is Cody O'Rourke and the Good Shepherd Collective uh, for their leadership in these efforts. I want to say thanks to my colleagues, Reverend Ali Perry from UCC PIN and Philip Farah from uh, Palestine, Palestinian Christian Alliance for Peace. These folks are national leaders, not just leaders of their organizations, but national leaders who I uh, am honored and delighted to call uh, compatriots in the struggle. And especially thank you to Bana, Mahmoud, and Jonathan. Uh, your leadership in these efforts are ones to be emulated, and we're hoping then to follow through with your charge to not only educate our, our constituents, to, but become active. And thanks to all of you for attending today. Um, go in peace. <laughs>